This video is sponsored by Sakurako. More of that later in this video. They say that before the Sage of Gods and Humanity, Tevat was once home to ferocious and terrifying dragons. In that period, the land of Tevat was nowhere near how it looks today, and some scholars nowadays believe that it was best suited to the dragon's conditions, rendering it completely uninhabitable by humans. However, no one really knows if this was the case. No one but those located in the heavens. It seems that only those who choose to know the truth of this world are none other than those at Celestia. Like any other world, Devat has the lore of how it came to be, but due to centuries of exchanges of the ruling power, some stories are long gone. Yet, there are surviving documents and relics in Enconomia that reveal the truth to those who are worthy. Now, this story I will tell you shall remain a secret, especially from the heavens above. From the books known as the Byakuya Koku Collection, we suspect it contains puzzle pieces to what happened before Celestia's rule, and some secrets they don't want anyone to hear. One specific serpent god has died for simply reading the forbidden knowledge I'm about to share. Note that this is my own interpretation, and thus might be interpreted differently as more source materials are presented. But as of now, it does contain a fascinating story that might answer some of the questions we have about this mystical world. To understand this lore without giving spoilers for those who still haven't done the quest, I recommend you to finish the world quest, Collection of Dragons and Snakes in Enconomia first. From here, we will receive the book titled Before Sun and Moon from the Byakuya Koku Collection. Nobody knows where Enconomia is before it grows from the Dark Sea. Theories say that the Dark Sea is generally just anywhere that is not covered by Tevat. The Byakuya Koku Collection heavily implies that this place is underneath the world covered by the sun. If so, then Enconomia can rise not just in Inazuma, but other places as well. This is just the theory, but if it's right, have y'all ever wondered why the people of Orobashi chose to reside in Inazuma instead of Liyue, or perhaps even Mondstadt? Aside from the obvious fact that it's nearer, rumors say that they might be charmed by the delicious foods and tasty drinks in the Japanese-themed nation. This is just a personal preference, but I do think that Japanese food is so tasty, and no, that's not simply because I'm also from Asia. Authentic Japanese food is what I've longed to try, and now, I've been given the opportunity to experience cuisine from the land of the rising sun from the comfort of my own home. And so can you. If you're like me, and you're wondering how these meals taste like in real life, you can order a box full of tasty treats and snacks from Sakura Ko. Sakura Ko is a monthly Japanese snack subscription box, full of 19 traditional, authentic, and artisan snacks, and also features one kitchenware. These boxes are personally created and provide authentic Japanese sweets, snacks, tea, and more from local makers in Japan every month, sent to your door straight from Japan. If you want to experience Japanese traditional tea time and taste the delightful Japanese snacks, you can subscribe by just using our code CLEMEN with 5% off on your first purchase. I'm excited to try these products. I'm actually overwhelmed with the number of food that is in one package. This is definitely worth the price, especially if you love Japanese culture like me. Sakurako is an amazing product whose company works hard to support local Japanese snack makers and give us a feel of their culture. We're very much delighted to try it and experience this for ourselves. The box also comes with this beautiful glass, so you will truly feel like you're in Japan. This is called the Sakura Glass, and it's a one-of-a-kind Japanese sake glass made exclusively for Sakurako. You can see the beautiful cherry blossom details mixed with luxurious golden accents. We're happy that Sakura Ko decided to partner with us for this video. This is the March 2022 Sakura Afternoon Tea, which is specially curated to let their customers experience the deliciousness of Japanese foods in the comfort of their own homes. And now with that said, we will be trying the Japanese snacks that Sakura Ko sent us. Okay, so the first one I chose was the Aji Shirabe Ume Senbei, where a senbei is a type of a rice cracker. When I first tasted it, it had a sweet and sour taste. It also had a very strong smell like a shrimp dipped in a bowl of vinegar. Now this next snack is called Nobunaga Shrimp and Red Wine Senbei. Clearly as said from the title, it is made of shrimp and red wine. A weird combination, right? But oh well, never judge a book by its cover. Now after that one bite, the first thing I liked about this snack is that it was really crunchy and you could instantly taste the red wine. The shrimp flavor then came as an aftertaste. 
As for the green tea cookie, it was really crunchy and well-baked. It immediately melted in my mouth, and that was when I tasted the strong green tea flavor. As soon as I read the green tea label on the packaging, I was already very excited to have a taste of this snack. It didn't disappoint me, and the snack was gone in an instant. Now the last snack I wanted to show you is the Kiyono Sato Matcha Cookie. On its first bite, it wasn't too sweet, and the green tea flavor was what caught me. The cream inside isn't what gives it the taste, but rather the outside. Maybe because it is where the matcha flavor is mixed in. All in all, I really enjoyed the snacks as it had a mix of sweet and traditional flavors, and the crunchiness of the cookies and crackers. Soon, I'll be trying the other snacks, and I'm really looking forward to more. Now, maybe you guys can also enjoy a box of Sakurako before you start your own journey in Ankonomiya. You can get 5% off by just using our code CLEMEN on your first purchase. Now, with that said, let's go back to the lore of Genshin Impact. If we recall back in Inazuma, there lies the remnants of a god, where its skull currently rests in Yashori Island. Its dead remains serve as a warning to anyone who comes across the truth, whether they intentionally seek the history of Devat, or accidentally obtained the truth that heaven is hiding. Who is this god? Well, his people call him the Watatsumi Omikami, and is also known as Orobashi no Mikoto. He was a god that led his people out of Enkonomiya, and built them a new home using the huge corals attached on his body. He also led an invasion of Yashori Island, and was killed there. So what led to his death? Why did he invade Yashori Island? To answer that, we'll have to view both the dramatic and historical points of view. Back before Enkonomiya's release, there were two books that talked about Orobashi's invasion of Yashori Island. These were the Sagunomiya Chronicles, and the preliminary study of Sagunomiya folk belief. Take note that these books were written by different authors, whereas the first one was written by a shogunate historian from the Kuja clan, while the second was written by a Sumeru scholar. The Sagunomiya Chronicles were written from the perspective of the Narukami people, while the preliminary study was by an outsider of Inazuma, but his work is widely accepted by both factions of Narukami and Watatsumi. To summarize the first book, it paints Sorobashi as a warmonger who suddenly invaded Yashori and brought great suffering to the Narukami people. As for the second book, it pointed out that the reason Orobashi invaded Yashori was because his people urged him, and they wanted new lands to call their home. They were suffering from famine, because their lands weren't as fertile as those islands in the west. While I first thought that this finally answers the question, there were more details that continued. It seems that the Sumeru scholar who wrote this book hypothesized that Orobashi brought war to Narukame Island, not because of conquests, but because of a needed sacrifice. Watatsumi Omikami had embarked upon a violent campaign not for conquest, but for sacrifice. The author also mentioned that Orobashi's true motives are not well recorded by history, and there were inscriptions that a shrine maiden hid, which highlight a prophecy about the certain defeat and the future of humiliation that awaited Orobashi's expedition. It seems that the author's hypothesis was right, and all those other records saying Orobashi declared war against the Electro Arkan because his people wanted new lands was all fiction. Now what then really happened? Why did Orobashi sacrifice himself? If we continue reading the book, the author adds another hypothesis, wherein he says that Orobashi was a coward god that fled into the Dark Sea to avoid the Arkan War. The Sumeru author added that this fact was considered a grave sin, and so it was upon heaven's order that Orobashi went to his death. Unfortunately, some of the details he mentioned are false. To put it simply, what really happened was that while Orobashi was in Enkonomiya, he discovered and read a book that details about a time before Celestia. Shortly after they left Enkonomiya, Orobashi unknowingly shared this information with his followers. Because they were in Tevat again, this reached Celestia's attention. This information is far too dangerous to be known to any god in Tevat, so Celestia found him and his people guilty. Celestia issued him a demand to either sacrifice himself or his civilization the people of Watatsumi will perish. It was either him or his people. Orobashi loves his newfound people and didn't want them to see them suffer at the heavenly principles. So as a final decision, he went ahead with the former choice of sacrificing himself and saving his civilization. He devised a plan to conceal the real reasons for his death. 
he would declare war against their neighbors, A and Makoto, knowing full well that he wouldn't stand a chance against them and their mighty Muso no Hitotachi. Orobashi made it seem like a surprise military campaign against the Electro Archon, in a bid to give his people more land. Before he and his army departed for war, Orobashi allowed some record keepers from Enkonomiya to know some of the truth he learned, under the condition that all of it must be forgotten and buried, and placing them under many forms of hidden puzzles and trials that could only be accessed by those who are worthy. This is to not allow just anyone to come across this information and actually have the strength to handle the consequences of learning this forbidden knowledge. This is the reason why we needed to go through many trials before entering Enkonomiya. Even inside the region, we also encountered the Jibashiri, the law enforcement officers of Enkonomiya, who were stationed there to determine whether we are worthy of learning the truth, as well as to facilitate the curbing of holy soil. Going back to Orobashi, he was later killed by A with the Musono Hitotachi and fulfilled the demands of Celestia. As sad as it may be, he knew this sacrifice was necessary to save his people. As for the people of Otatsumi Island, not knowing the truth, would bear a grudge and resentment towards the Electro Archon and the Shogunate for the defeat of their god. At this point, only the record keepers that Orobashi left in Enkonomiya knew any semblance of the truth of his death. If you want a more detailed view, you can check out our video, Why Orobashi Declared War Against Baal, to understand what happened between the first war of Otatsumi and Narukami. It highlights some historical figures like Sasayori and Tozano, who were both involved in the war and how the better relationship between Watatsumi Island and the Shogunate escalated into the situation nowadays. Now that we've clarified some details regarding the truth behind Orobashi's death, this chapter will answer why eternal darkness now plagues Ankonomiya. This region has been away from the rest of Tevats for an unknown amount of years. It is almost impressive how the Ankonomians managed to live here, alongside the huge bishops that brought forth terror. However, how did they arrive at such a grim fate? To answer that, let's go back to the beginning. The one of which Orobashi learned that got him deemed guilty by Celestia. Imagine a world without Archons and Celestia. What would that world be like? How different would it be from the Tevat that we know? Well, while we know little about this era, there are those who have recorded details about this long gone age. The answer lies in the Byakuya Koku Collection, a series of novels based on Watatsumi's folktales. In your quest to find the knowledge of the hidden truth in Enkonomiya, you will first encounter the second volume of the Byakuya Koku Collection, entitled Before Sun and Moon. While this is the second volume of the collection, it is the first quest item that you will get if you follow the world quest. It's recommended that you read the book in the order that you obtain them, which is as follows. Before Sun and Moon, the Serpent and Drakes of Tokoyo Koku, in the light beneath the shadow, hydrological studies in Byakuya Koku, and lastly, Bathismal Bishop experimental records. Before Sun and Moon was written by a person only known as the Scribe of Isteroth. This Isteroth is now known as Tokoyo Okami, whose identity I will explore later in this video. Now according to the description of the book, it says, a chronicle that ordinary folk has been forbidden to read. The writing is a mix of fables and histories, from the beginning of the world to the creation of the Dainichi Mikoshi. This particular book details a time before Celestia came into the world. It's one of a kind, and no other lore mentions this era. While some details from the archive give a few hints, Before Sun and Moon is the only book that gives a detailed account of this bygone period. To start, there were once two realms that divided the world. It was known as the Light Realm and the Void Realm. Each of these two realms also has different names, such as the Light Realm, being sometimes called the Elemental Realm or the Bishop Realm. As for the Void Realm, it is also called the Abyss Realm. It is said that the Light Realm has always opposed the Abyss Realm like an infinite battle of light and darkness. What is the Light Realm? Why is it also called the Bishop Realm? In the Light Realm, there was a race of dragons that predates humanity itself. Much like there are Jew bishops or Bethesmal bishops, there are also ancient dragons that were once the dominant race of all times. Their race is the progenitor to all other dragon subspecies, such as the bishops. While we encountered some dragons such as Dvalin or Ajda, these never are the original generation of dragons that actually predates the gods and humanity. These dragons were described as pure primordial beings who are so powerful that their environment adapts to a suitable habitat tailored for them. 
The Watatsumi people would later come to name this phenomenon as holy soil. They were also extremely intelligent because of how they were able to develop their own language and can later learn human speech with little effort. In this age, there were the seven sovereigns that were once considered to be the kings or lords of the dragon race. They are the most powerful creatures and have ruled this world long before Celestia has appeared. Each of these seven sovereigns represents an element, such as the dragon of water, the dragon of fire, the dragon of ice, the dragon of earth, and etc. Thus, they are elemental dragons at the pinnacle of the raw and primitive elemental forces. While they are considered the most powerful amongst their kind, they are not immortal. When one of the seven sovereigns dies, another dragon or bishop then evolves to take the place of the deceased lord. Thus, the rule of the seven sovereigns continued on, and this has been the way for a long time. The seven sovereigns thought that this shall be forever, but it'll change at the arrival of the primordial one. He is considered the progenitor god, or the first god that has arrived in the world of Devat, in a time highlighted in the book as, when the doves held branches, an eternal throne of the heavens came, and the world was made anew. It was then that the true lord, the primordial one, came forth and did battle against the seven terrifying sovereigns, dragon lords of the old world. The primordial one created shining shades of itself, and the number of these shades was four. However, the author mentioned that one of the four is named Istaroth, who come by many other names such as Tokoyo Okami, Kairos, the God of Time, and the Thousand Winds. It is strongly suspected that she was the other god worshipped in the early days of Mondstadt, along with Barbatus' rule. Her story will be explored more later in this series. Now, who is the primordial one? This entity was only briefly mentioned in Before Sun and Moon, as it was notably absent in the rest of the Byakuya Koku collection. One description about this being can be read. The primordial one may have been Fanes. It had wings in a crown, and was birthed from an egg, androgynous in nature. But for the world to be created, the egg shell had to be broken. However, Fanes, the primordial one, used the egg shell to separate the universe and the microcosm of the world. With the new powerful god entering and threatening the rule of the dragons, a war between this entity and the seven sovereigns began. It ravaged the world of Tevats, but in the end, the primordial one, along with its shining shades of itself, emerged victorious against the seven sovereigns. It was said that this war happened for 40 years, as highlighted with the phrase, 40 winters entombed the flames, and 40 summers churned the seas. The seven sovereigns were vanquished, and the seven nations submitted to the heavens. Now what's interesting here is how they refer to the primordial one as the heavens. Since there are different authors of the books, they might have referred to different entities with the same name. For example, the people of Tevat nowadays associate heavens with Celestia, but in the Byakuya Koku collection, the primordial one is also referred to as the heavens, to which the people of the seven sovereigns bowed down to. Alternatively, the arrival of the primordial one is described as the first throne of the heavens. The author thinks that it might be called Fanes, based on the progenitor god of creation, because it is the first one who established the heavens where Celestia currently rules. The primordial one and its four shining shades might also be the first residents of Celestia. As all of Tevat bowed to the primordial one's reign, its first act after defeating the seven sovereigns was to begin creating heaven and earth, a process that lasted almost 400 years. The Primordial One ensured that the new Earth will be habitable for humans. It envisioned a place far from the dark and scary world that it used to be. In its new creation, it created the human realm, where the sun is shining brightly, mountains rising from the earth, and rivers sustaining the roots of the land. Thus, there were now three realms that existed, the human realm, the light realm, and the void realm. However, the victory of the Primordial One is not entirely met with welcoming arms. Some surviving followers of the Sovereigns rebelled, and went into the oceans to flee from the current ruler of Tevat. They fled to the only place out of Heaven's rule, which is called the Dark Sea. There, it is where the surviving bishops hid from the lights that the Primordial One brought. Meanwhile, the Primordial One continued to shape the world of Tevat. It wasn't until 400 years later that the first humans were finally created. 400 years after the held branches, the primordial one and one of its four shades created the birds of the air, the beasts of the earth, and the fish of the sea. Together, they also created flowers, grass, and trees before finally creating humans. From that time, our ancestors made a covenant with the primordial one and so entered into a new age. 
With a more pleasant surrounding, away from the dragons and bishops who ruled the old world, humans immediately bowed down to the primordial one, thus entering a new age, one called the Year of the Ark's Opening. The primordial one had a sacred plan for humans. As long as they were happy, it too rejoiced. People started learning things in their new surroundings. They farmed the soil to grow crops. They mined the mountains for ores. They raised livestock to sustain their needs. And they gathered together, rejoicing and writing poems. The heaven, which is ruled by the primordial one, made sure that the humans were satisfied. When there's hunger, the sky will rain and bless their crops. When people suffer from poverty, the earth will bring forth its riches. The land of Tevat has seen its most bountiful era since the reign of the Seven Sovereigns. The Primordial One had made sure that everyone was happy during his rule. But in the deepest parts of Tevat, the followers of the Seven Sovereigns that escaped are still lurking in the darkness. This place that is not under the rule of the Primordial One is called the Dark Sea. The Dark Sea is used as a general term for places that is not under the rule of the Seven Archons. There, the remaining followers of the Sovereigns lived in darkness, but away from humanity. They can never hurt anyone from the Primordial One's beloved humans. While the length of the Primordial One's rule is unknown, the book before Sun and Moon mentioned that people were happy during the year of Jubilee. In Christianity, a Jubilee year occurs after every seventh Sabbath year, which is every 50 years. This means that the people of Tevat celebrated the Primordial One's rule for 50 years. In this age, all humanity was under a great unified nation that spanned the world. The early people of Enkonomia was a part of this civilization before succumbing deep into the inner parts of Tevat. While things seemed great in the old world of Tevat, war soon once again knocked on its doors. Suddenly, a second throne of the heavens came. For reasons unknown, they seek to take control of the heaven from the primordial one. Thus, war ravaged the peaceful world of Tevat. People who have enjoyed the bountiful produce of the lands and the sparkling gemstones of the mountains are now suffering from drought. But worse, a part of Tevat collapsed into the depths. Due to the War of the Heavens, the land we now know as Byakuya, Koku, or Enkonomiya fell past the dominion of the Primordial One and into the Dark Sea. Yet in the Dark Sea, the original inhabitants of Tevat, the followers of the Sovereigns, were already living in that place. While we now call them bishops, the people of Enkonomiya once referred to them as the Dragon Heirs of the Depths. As with the world above, the Enkonomians were exposed to war. However, unlike in the world above, this war is not for who sits on the throne of the heavens, but rather for survival. As told by the author of the book, they said, Our ancestors chased them into the shadows with the light of a thousand lanterns, and they hid in those shadows, hunting us. But there was only darkness in this place, and so their hunting grounds were untrammeled. Having stuck in the darkness, the people of Enkonomiya immediately lit fires to easily see the area around them. As the fickle lights illuminated the place, loud, thunderous roars were suddenly heard from afar. As the Enkonomians feared for their lives, the only weapons that they can use to defend themselves were the forks and pickaxes that they once used for farming and mining. Granted, they were not equipped for fights such as these because they never expected to fall from their original home. The Enkonomians had no choice to fight back from being killed by these savage creatures. It is never exactly mentioned how many years this war continued, but it seems that the Enkonomians were exposed to war for a long time, and they started to craft weapons made from the bones of their enemies. We see these weapons scattered across Enkonomia, and it is interesting that they managed to survive. As they strive for survival, they still held their faith that they will be rescued by their beloved god, the Primordial One. Perhaps someday, they will see the brightness of the sun once again. Unfortunately, there was no response from the Primordial One or its three other shades. The only one that answered their call was Istaroth. Who is Istaroth? Istaroth is believed to be a female god who controls time and moments. Istaroth is also one of the four shades that the Primordial One created. She has a lot of many different names that I mentioned earlier. For the Enkonomians, they first referred to her as Kairos and she is the personification of undying wind, time, and moments. The author of the book also calls her the mother of 14 billion years. It isn't entirely sure if this is true, but imagine if Tevat has been around for 14 billion years. That even exceeds our Earth's existence, which has only been around for 4.5 billion years. 
Now because Isdaroth was the only one who answered, some Enkinameans dedicated themselves to becoming the scribes of Isdaroth, where their jobs were to record history and the passage of time in the lightless land. They began recording every information from before their descent and thereafter. Meanwhile, as the Enkinameans were still trapped below, the battle above ended. When the Enkinameans tried to go outside, no matter where they went, they found it impossible to figure out any pathways out of Enkinamea. They became convinced that they were sealed and were not allowed to escape. The author of the book assumed that it was the primordial one that won the war and sealed them. However, we the players strongly believe that it was the second throne that won instead. With no way of escape, the Enkinameans were facing a grim situation. They needed to escape this darkness or else they would all die from the Dragonairs. It was then that a hero would come to save them and guide them towards a light that they would have never imagined. Now this story will be further explained in part 2 of this series and is where the story of Enkinomiya properly begins. But before we end this video, what do you guys think of the Primordial One? Does this really seem to be the truth of this world? Now I want you guys to share your opinions in the comments below. As for my thoughts, it's evident that there are a few contradicting points in the book before Sun and Moon. We can't help but think that these inconsistencies might be due to the fact that the person transcribing the events was not present for much of what was written. For example, the Seven Sovereigns ruled long before humans were created by the Primordial One. This makes me wonder, from who did they heard this story? Some say that it was Istroth who knew of this, mainly because she is the god of time and moments and could see everything that happened in history. However, let us see how the developers will expand more on this story. Furthermore, the wording of the book itself brings questions about the reliability of what is being said, particularly in this passage, on Fanes or the Primordial One, and the Primordial One may have been Fanes. The fact that the scribe wasn't sure that the Primordial One's name is Fanes and yet continues to address it as such might have been a clue to the truthfulness of what was transcribed. Another confusing thing is that the phrase Doves held branches is almost similar to the common phrase doves with an olive branch, which is a universal symbol of peace, calmness, and serenity. A rule of terror by the seven sovereigns isn't exactly what one might call peaceful, and yet the author of Before Sun and Moon decided to use that term. Is there some sort of hidden meaning behind these words? Can it be that the primordial one, although worshipped by humans, is really the cause of continuous war in Tevat? Whether that theory holds merit or not, it doesn't change the fact that bishops, or the followers of the Seven Sovereigns, are indeed terrifying. They are considered enemies, and do attack when you come near them. But let's remember that the other creatures in this world might have been innocent, and yet we considered them as enemies like the Hillagerals. With all these confusing details and only one book to rely on for facts, we can't arrive at a decisive conclusion yet. I'm certain there is more to the Sarah than we are currently presented. With all my personal thoughts said, you can click on to see the next video. I'm Clementine, and I will see you in the next.